Every one of you has fallen in love with a story, whether it's Harry Potter or Hamlet or Fast and Furious 7 <laughs> or the New Testament. And we fall in love with stories, as Abraham Verges said at the beginning, because they transport us to new worlds of experience and to new places in ourselves. Reading them, watching them, listening to them enlarges our consciousness. Well, as we close today, what I'd like to do is I'd like to help you fall in love with telling stories because the act of telling a story, like the story you just heard, can also transport you and enlarge your consciousness, especially if you follow three of the habits that are common to all storytellers. And I want to offer these three habits to you. First, through a quick story of my own, uh, which is the first time that I encountered these three habits, and then I'm just going to run down them. So I grew up in rural Maine, not Lewiston, but nearby Lewiston, and I went to a Jesuit high school that had a lot of the usual Jesuit traditions, including a really strict dress code, coat, tie, dress shoes, no jeans. Not a tradition that I was excited about. And I, in particular, hated the tie part. Uh, but one tradition I really did like was in May of senior year, we had what we called May Projects, where all of the seniors for six weeks did community service. Now, initially, the reason that I liked it was because no dress code. But I was assigned to a nursing home called the Jewish Home for the Aged on the Eastern Prom of Portland. And I was assigned a mentor, a Jesuit, my senior English teacher named Father Farrell, this tall, beautiful, older, elegant Jesuit who I really admired. And I was to meet with him every week to report on what my experience was. And my assignment was essentially simple. Find out what life is like for the aged at this home. Well, after just one week, I went to Father Farrell, and he could tell that aside from getting my ass kicked a lot in Scrabble, I didn't really experience very much. So he said, why don't you try focusing on just one person? So I did, and the next week, I chose Esther Fain, this woman from originally from Long Island who had been in the home for over 30 years, who had these giant glasses, I don't know if any of you remember these, that had the little arms that came down and connected to the bottom. Somebody called them Jesse, Sally Jesse glasses. And she had the best smile. It was like a flower in the sunshine. And I chose her partly because she seemed like one of the loneliest people there. She only had one daughter who lived in Boston who would come up uh, once a month and have lunch with her, and that's all. And also I chose her, frankly, because she had the coolest room in the whole place. When she had moved in, they had brought a lot of her original furniture, carpets, drapes, paintings, including this one giant wardrobe, the biggest one I had ever seen. It was like it was out of a C.S. Lewis novel. So, I quickly learned that the way to get that smile out of Esther was to ask her about her husband, Carlo, who had died more than 40 years before. Now, Carlo cut quite the figure. He was Italian, he worked in men's fashion, and he was a real bon vivant. He loved partying, he loved dancing. And so Esther would sit on her bed with me and she would tell me about all of their adventures. And then on Friday afternoons, I would go and I would sit in the English classroom with Father Farrell at the end of the day, and I would repeat, retell her stories to him. Stories about how Carlo used to borrow formal wear from boutiques that he dealt with, and they would sneak into parties out on the Hamptons and lie about who they were. <laughs> stories about how when he lost his job um, and wouldn't come out of his room, she made his favorite meal, banana pancakes with mashed potatoes and bacon. How's that for a combo? <laughs> for every meal until he finally came out in his best suit and hit the pavement, got out there again. And then a story about how one night she was sick and she couldn't go with him to the dance and she said, you go ahead. And how on the way back from that dance, he was killed in a car accident. So one of the things that I noticed sharing all of these stories with Father Farrell every week was that I not only understood something about Esther, about what it was like to be aged, I started to feel as though I lived in Esther's life, that I could feel it from the inside. And this was a really remarkable experience for me. Until one day, toward the end of the program, in week five, um, 
I went to Father Farrell for our last meeting. I still had a few days left with Esther. And I brought him up to speed on what was going on and the latest stories. But at the end, he noticed that I hesitated. And he said, is there anything else going on? And I said, well, actually, yeah. A few days before, Esther had sat down with me and put me quite deliberately in this chair and said, stay right there. And she went over to the wardrobe and she drew out this long silver box. And it was from the left side of the wardrobe where there were still tons of Carlo's clothes. And she brought it over to me, sat down on the, t on the edge of the bed, and just delicately handed it over to me, and as she did, opened the box. And what was inside? This gold and silver tie. Now, I told Father Farrell, of course, she doesn't know that I hate ties. But more importantly, I felt like this was too personal. It was too intimate. I felt so weird about accepting something from a man who'd been dead for 40 years, from this woman that I'd only known for a little while. And as I was telling him this story and explaining my feelings, I kept seeing her opening that box. And then after I replied to her, actually, I don't need a tie, no thank you. Her struggling to get that cover back on the box and pulling it back into her lap. As I'm describing this to Father Farrell, I'm realizing that for her, this gift was a way for her to share and maybe keep alive the thing that she loved most in her life, Carlo. And I had refused it. And Father Farrell, being very astute, could tell that I was kind of having this little epiphany. And he said to me, do you still feel the same way? And I said, honestly, no, now I don't. And he said, what are you going to do? So the next week I go back, and on the very last day, I'm really nervous because I think if I bring this up again, she might be hurt, she might not remember it. I don't know what's going to happen. But I sit her down and I say, Esther, do you remember last week when you showed me that tie? And she just had this very neutral expression. She just kind of tilted her head a little bit. But I plowed forward. I said, it was that silver and gold tie. I wanted to tell you that actually I do need a tie. And I really liked that one. And again, without changing her expression at all, she got up very slowly, walked around the bed, and then finally turned to the wardrobe and opened up that left side of the wardrobe and turned back and looked at me and said, it's a beauty, isn't it? And for years afterwards, if I ever had to wear a tie, that was the tie that I wore. Now, this was a big turning point experience for me. It certainly changed the relationship I had with my grandparents, who I appreciated a lot more after this. But it also introduced me to three habits that all storytellers share. And I'm going to share them with you, not to tell, for you to become great storytellers, but instead because these habits help us enlarge our consciousness. Telling stories with these habits help us live lives with more awareness, authenticity, and intimacy. So the first one is telling to discover. Now, a lot of us have this idea that when we tell a story, we're essentially communicating something that's already fully realized in our minds. We load it in, and then all we're going to do is express it, even if it's the first time we're telling it when actually any writer will tell, and many of you may have had this experience, that when you're telling a story, the meaning of the story is emerging in the embodied act of telling the story. Now this habit we, we kind of honors something that Jean Le Carré, the famous spy novelist, once said. He said, there are moments in life that are, have too much stuff in them to be lived at the time that they occur. Isn't that great? And so for us, tell a story with your attention not to impressing someone or being heard, but instead for perceiving something about the experience that you don't already know. The second one, tell someone else's story. Most of the time, whose story are we telling? our own story, in our own heads, all the time. We're interested in our own story. Now, 
This is not only so that we develop a lot more empathy for other people, but also because it's a vehicle for discovering more about ourselves. And in fact, this is dramatized all the time in literature. In Shakespeare, for example, it's when characters pretend to be somebody else that they not only develop empathy for others, but they discover their own nature. For me, in my story, I, um, all of that telling stories to Father Farrell week after week about Esther prepared me for that recognition that my reaction to her gift giving was very self-centered and allowed me to kind of break through and have a new view of it. So pick somebody that you know, maybe somebody close to you, and learn their story, tell it, and watch what happens. And now the third, and I think maybe most important uh, habit that all storytellers share, is let the world speak. Now I'm not talking about the literal voices that already are surrounding us. Facebook, Twitter, TED Talks. <laughs> Even colleagues in your family. I'm talking about the scene, the physical surrounding, the environment. So in my story, this was that silver box that was so delicately opened and closed. It was like a voice breaking through saying, pay attention to me. This is treasure. I mean, it was silver and the tie was silver and gold. And I could feel that. It was like a little flag saying, pay attention, pay attention. And it allowed me to understand that there was something deeper going on that I wasn't aware of, that I wasn't already thinking of. Um, writers know that the world is laying in wait for us and that often the biggest meaning in our lives is contained in the smallest detail around us, in these small things. So pay attention, listen. And I'm going to just give you one quote, um, which is from one of, one of my favorite authors, Franz Kafka who said, life's splendor forever lies in wait about each one of us in all its fullness. Listen, the world will freely offer itself to you to be unmasked. It has no choice. It will roll over in ecstasy at your feet. So these three practices or habits that I think all storytellers share, I offer to you not for artistry, but to live lives with greater presence. I think that for most of us, one of the things that we're hungry for is to live with more presence to ourselves, to each other, and to the world. And these are essentially equipment for living. They're tools to generate that kind of presence. I hope that they serve you. Thank you.